five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Diary of a Kitty Warrior, sharing faith, knowledge, hope, and love. Hi, and welcome to Diary of a Kitty Warrior podcast. My name is Dee Moore, and I am a stage four kidney warrior. This podcast is dedicated to encourage, educate, and inspire as we explore all aspects of kidney disease, chronic illnesses, and health. If you have any questions or ideas for topics you would like me to cover, please get in contact with me on social media using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. The statistics show that black, Asian and minority ethnic communities are five times more likely to develop kidney failure. And so joining me today is my guest, Della Iduwu, founder of Gold, Gift of Living Donation. And we will be talking about Living Kidney Donation and the UK black community. Hi and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior, the podcast. How are you doing today, Della? I'm very good. And how about yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really looking forward to our interview today. So I'm going to jump in with my first question. And so you are founder of Gold, Gift of Living Donation. So tell me your story. How did Gold begin? Oh, my story. Um it was actually, it's a personal journey. I, it was a personal reason why um, I'm actually being here today and having this conversation with you. Um, my dad had died in Nigeria and I, my brother had come over just for Sunday lunch. I thought it was going to just be a regular Sunday lunch where we would have a normal chat and banter and just prepare for a dad's funeral. And he then said to me that he wouldn't be able to come. And I'm like, well, why not? And then he said to me that he had kidney failure, um, that he would be needing a kidney transplant. And I was like, wow, um, that was the first time I was actually silent and I just burst into tears. I mean, he had known for six months and I, I remember saying to him, well, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me ages ago that you had kidney disease and you, know, you needed a transplant? And he said he didn't know how to say, it. he didn't know how to put it into words. And I remember we were talking about um, dialysis and how long he would have to wait for a transplant because we know that people within the black community don't come forward as, as organ donors. And um, he then was talking about um, living donation. And I remember saying to him, living donation, <laughs> what's that? And when he told me that it's somebody, you know, within your family or friend who can donate a kidney, I said, yes. Immediately, I said yes to me. It was a no-brainer. Um, this was my brother. I loved him. I didn't want him to spend years on dialysis while waiting for a transplant. So for me, he said yes. And I have to say, D, in, in that moment, I saw hope. I just saw hope, light, lit up in my, in my brother's eyes. And that was the beginning of this journey. Um, next day, I was up at Guy's Hospital. Um, did a urine, did a blood test. Uh, we were six out of six tissue match. I was what great, you know, I'm a perfect match for my brother. And I was on a roller coaster of emotions. Um, and as you know, they do, the tests that they do are just so stringent, you know, because they're taking a healthy person and they're putting this person through surgery. So they're just going to have to make sure that they don't put your life as a donor at risk. And um, it was fantastic. You know, the first test I did, the second test, and then the third test, things were beginning to show up. I was beginning to get a lot of protein in my urine. And to be honest, that didn't really mean anything to me. As far as I'm concerned, I was a six or six teacher match. I was going to donate to my brother. But if I'm to fast forward um, six or seven months, I was told that I actually had an underlying health condition myself and that I wouldn't be able to donate to my brother. I was absolutely devastated. I was heartbroken because all I could see was my brother spending years on dialysis 
while waiting for a transplant. And I knew at that time, on average, black people waited three to four years. I, I just couldn't imagine that. Um, so there was nothing I could do. But I, I remember my consultant saying to me, Modella, what are you going to do now? Is there any other people in your family that might come forward? And I said to my consultant very flippantly that actually, you know what, while I was on this journey, I found out that a lot of black people, one, didn't know you could live with one kidney, didn't know what living donation was about. So I thought, you know what, something positive has got to come out of this experience. And I'll go back to my community, raise awareness of living kidney donation. So that was how, and that was what inspired me to set up GOLD. That's such an amazing and touching story to know that something so good can come out of a situation with your brother. And although you weren't in a position to help him directly by donating a kidney, you've helped him in terms of raising awareness within the community and also so many people in the wider community that you've helped as well. That's such a really such a touching story of how it all came about and it really warms my heart and puts a smile on my face. It, it really does. It's interesting you to say that because um, I, I sometimes, sometimes as a family, we sit down and I, I sometimes say to Taya, I said, you know what? I do wonder if I was a match, if I could donate to you, would I have gone on to do all this work? And dear, I really don't think so. I think I would have just donated and I would have gone back to what I was doing before, which was working in Nigeria with aid orphans. I have a charity in, in Nigeria for aid orphans. So I would have gone back to have done that. Um, but also, I, I as, a, as a Christian, I honestly do feel that my faith really kind of had a part to play in this and then the journey that, that, it, that it has taken me. Because out of that, um, as I said to you earlier, in the black community, we, I think, first of all, when I first came forward, I wanted to find that, I wanted to find somebody within my community who had donated. I wanted to find out a bit, a bit more information. And when I first came forward, there wasn't a lot of information about living donation within the NHS here. A lot of the information we had was from America. And I wanted to find out what does my community say about living donation? You know, what does my faith say about living donation? So it was interesting. And I think one way of dealing or helping me to come to terms with my not being able to help my brother was to write a book. I wrote a book about my journey and it was just for me to have some sort of closure um, but I wrote it really from a black perspective, you know, well, what does our community say about living donation or organ donation? Well, what does my faith say? You know, um, the different emotions that you go through that actually healthcare professionals can't tell you because they haven't experienced it. And it actually turned into a book that's just so easy to read um, that now if you are coming forward as a living donor, whether you're black or white, um, your living donor coordinator will give you more than a match because it tells you all about the living donor process. But it's also good for somebody who is a kidney patient and they're thinking, well, how do I ask my loved one to be a kidney donor? Because they don't know much about it. So that book is also for them to read and say, okay, so these are the tests that I'm asking my loved one or my friend to go through. These are some of the emotions that they might feel. Um, so in that sense, it's been a really good valuable tool for, for the black community in terms of knowing a little bit more about living donation. It's a way of in, empowering them to be able to make that right decision. Your book sounds like a very powerful and valuable tool to help people so tell me more about the work that you do with gold what exactly do you do it really is raising awareness of living donation within the black community so we've done a lot of work in collaboration with nhs in terms of different outreach and different community projects 
because I honestly believe that NHSBT, they have the right message, but I think having the right messengers to get their message across is very, very important. So we've done a huge amount of work with NHSBT. We've done so many different projects, community projects, whereby we're working in collaboration in terms of getting more people to think about living donation, um, not only with the living donor teams, but also with your um, chronic kidney disease um, nurses and clinicians as well. So quite often and in previous podcasts, I've broached the subject before, but I really want to take the opportunity to ask this question as you do so much in this area. The statistics show that in black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities, there's a low number of people coming forward to be living donors or organ donors, full stop. Why do you think that this is the case? I think there's so many different reasons. Um, I think a lot of it is individual because people ask me, well, Della, how come you said yes to your brother? You're black, you're, you're a Christian. And I think a lot of it, again, is... Within the black community, you've got people who have just got a different mindset as well. For me, it was a no brainer. But on my journey, I think a lot of people say no to what they don't know. And I found that when I explain to people, what, what, you know, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be live. I couldn't do that. But when I said, well, if it was you know, one of your loved ones and your brother or your sister needed a kidney, would you do that? And it's very interesting, the response that a lot more people would come forward as a living donor to help their loved ones than to sign up to the organ donor register. For that, that was something that one, they wouldn't do. It, it was foreign to them. It's not part of their culture. While for us, being able to help somebody is very much part of who we are. So we actually do have quite a, not as many as, the white community but we have over 550 black living donors within the UK and that number I have to say would be higher if a lot of us didn't have underlying health issues because at least a third of black people that do come forward as living donors like myself can't go on to donate. Wow that is a significant number of people. I mean, that's quite telling, actually. And I think that it's important that people are aware of these factors because I think that there could be a lot of negative associations and stereotypes about people from BAME communities because people outside of these communities may be thinking, well, why aren't you doing this? You know, and why I ask the question is because I really believe it's important for people to have an understanding of why there is lower numbers. I mean, that is an alarming number, really. And it shows that it isn't because people are just selfish and they don't want to help and that the desire isn't there. That actually there's people that have come forward and for health reasons, um, they're not suitable to be a a living donor, uh, but they wanted to be. So I think it's important that people are aware that that's not the case and to see the situation for what it is. I mean, there's a gene. I mean, there's a, there's a gene. I, I mean, I, I give you an example, you know, a classic example for my brother. Obviously, I wasn't successful. My, my, one of my daughters came forward. Um, she was in her 20s then. Um, or we didn't realise that she had really high, high blood pressure. So she couldn't donate you know that was an underlying issue that she had my brother had we had two cousins two male cousins who came forward they were African and there's a particular trait or gene in black African men that puts them at a higher risk if they donate so you've got all of these factors that do come to play um, when, when we come forward yes there's no comparison to the white community but as you rightly said, I do think it's something that needs to, to, to come out, out that, you know, it's not that we are not willing. There's some of us who, for some reason or another, we just can't just donate for our underlying um, reasons. And, and that's almost one of the reasons why it, when we think of COVID, um, a, a lot of Black people, why, we were, why did it affect us a lot? Because a lot of us have underlying health issues that deep 
were not even aware of. I wasn't aware of my underlying health condition whatsoever until I came forward as a donor. My daughter, we never knew that she had high blood pressure until she came forward as a donor. That is very telling as well. And also something that I've touched on in previous podcasts, more than one person that I've interviewed, it wasn't until they had their blood test and they realized that they were in kidney failure and they were, and they were immediately put on dialysis. So this is why in the episode on World Kidney Day, we address the, you don't look sick comment that people make because as you said, you can have these underlying conditions, you're living your normal life, working, doing X, Y, and Z, and you don't know that you have these conditions. And it really highlights the point that looking well in speech marks or even feeling well in speech marks isn't the whole story. And so it really is so important that you know your numbers and get yourself checked out. That yearly blood test and urine test tells you so much. And that test could be the difference between saving your life or as you said, being in the position to be a living donor or having a better quality of life. So that highlights so many things that I feel so strongly about. Also, in terms of reasons why people from BAME communities don't come forward and we're specifically looking at the black community, are there cultural or other aspects that affect people's decisions while they're not coming forward? I mean, I'm a British Nigerian. I, I was born born here. So maybe that was why for me coming forward as a, a living donor was a no brainer for me. But when we think of the majority of black people and the, the age group where most of us are living donors or might join the organ donor register, we came here either when we were, we were young and organ donation is, is not something, it, it's just foreign. It, it's absolutely foreign. I mean, it's just unheard of in, in our culture. If you're ill or you're passing, this is your time. And you'd have to go as you've come. It, it's, so it's quite foreign. So we've now come to this country or we've now been brought up in this country and you're asking us to do something that traditionally is not something that we do. And, and I always say sometimes that if you even ask us as a culture, um, rarely do we, we don't eat fish and chips on a, on a Friday. There's some cultural things that we just don't do. Does that make sense to you? You know, we're yes. probably not out in a pub, you know, on, a fr- on the evening. Because culturally, we just don't do that. We buy our we buy our drinks and just probably stay at home. So it for me, it's much very much a cultural thing. And but you can't talk about culture without talking about faith within the black community because they, they go very much together. So you have a, a group of people who believe that God will strongly heal them, and they have every right to believe that. But I also believe, as a Christian myself, that um, for me, it's trusting God that he has given people the knowledge and the information to be able for us to have, you know, a life and a transplant and still, still believe in God. And I think when I think of my mom, when we told her that, you know, both her children might be going under live the knife, I mean, her first instinct was, was no. But then we explained to her what the whole procedure was. And my mum is 80, she was 80 then, a strong born again Christian. And what my mum said was, okay, if that's your decision, now you've educated me about it and I know about it. I will go and pray that the surgery will be ex Sussex. So that was how my mother used her faith. Does that make sense? She didn't say, okay, let's go and lay hands on you. Let's wait on God, you know, there must be, Doctor, she understands, and that was how she used her. She used her faith. Um, we're getting there. I think the next generation, they're saying, "Well, well, hold on a second. I remember we did um, a project with Brent Council, Brent Public Health. We did a project in a secondary school, City Academy, and we were talking about organ donation within the Black and Asian community. 
and, and I shared my story and we left them with a project. And that project was to, well, think about organ donation and come up with a poster. So it was more of a poster competition. And then what Transport for London was going to do was get the winning poster on an Oyster card. So that was their project. It was a fantastic project. So we got Tesco's involved, we've got IKEA involved, we've got the general public involved. They were, we asked them to nominate their poster. We had about 200 posters. And then when we had the award ceremony, we had the mayor of Brent that came and we had all the different parents. There was this particular black gentleman that stood up and he said his daughter challenged him because when she came home with her poster, he was like, we don't do that. Black people don't donate. Well, you know, where are you coming from with that? But she kept on asking him, but why not, Dad? If it saves lives, we heard Della's story. Why wouldn't we want to do that? And she challenged him and challenged him. He said, well, she was going to be an organ donor when she could, because as far as she's concerned, it's the right thing to do. He said that he began to question himself, though. Does he, is he saying no because culturally everybody else has said no? Because his daughter has given him an education and he stood up on that day and he said he never, ever thought that he would be an organ donor. Now he tells all his friends that, look, we've got to join the organ donor register to help our community. So I think sometimes it is about education. It is about knowledge. Knowledge is power. And I really believe that when people are empowered with knowledge, they do more to help themselves and to help others. So in terms of... Angelou that said is it if you know better you do better yes yes she did say that um yes the late Dr Maya Angelou did say that she's a very inspiring woman phenomenal as she would say yes (laughs) woman yes so in terms of someone who's thinking about living donation or maybe they've heard something on the radio or on a presentation from yourself What would be the first step for this individual in terms of the support that you offer? We've, we've said, and this was on the back of COVID, we set up, because what we used to do, we used to actually go into the hospitals and and talk to black patients and engage them in that way. But on the back of COVID, we set up um, the peer foam body scheme. And really what it is, it is, it's almost like, I would say like an integrated support system where we offer empowerment, education, and that emotional, emotional support. Because people are going down a path they've never been down before. And there's not gonna be many people who in your, in your environment who have been down that road. So what we try and do, we try and just get somebody who's thinking about living donation who has come forward to talk to her peer buddy, somebody who's gone through that process. It could be somebody, if she's going to donate to her sister, we might match her up with somebody who's donated to their sister and they can just talk about their experience. It's just about sharing their personal story. Well, this is what it was for me. This is how I felt. This is some of the tests that I went through. So that living donor knows that actually I'm not on this journey by myself and I've got all the support that I need right up to when they, if they're successful and after. And I think that is so important because you just empower people and you just give them that confidence. And I I always say that I wish when I came forward, I had that support. So maybe that's one of the reasons why I've set it up and it's proven being very, very successful because it just gives sometimes as a living donor you can't talk to the recipient you can't talk to the person who you're going to donate to about how you're feeling you probably can't talk to family members so you're talking to somebody who's your peer who's been through it who knows what to experience and knows exactly what who what you're going through and understands those different emotional feelings that you're feeling so I honestly believe that you know the peer body scheme it's really really good and It's about us as black people wanting to give back. We've had, we've been down that road. How can I now give back to my community? That that sounds so amazing. I can only imagine that when you're going through that process, when you have any fears or anxieties, 
how can you talk about it with the person that you're actually going to donate to which would be a family member or if you even if you speak to a different family member it might come back to the person that you're going to donate to so i can imagine that could be really really difficult for that person so having somebody completely independent that you can talk to about any fears or anxieties i could see how that support would be a lifeline really for that person so that sounds so amazing so how do they start the peer body process well it's 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 twofold um because it's open to both patients as well as well as potential living donors oh, so okay. if for example i just use my just my setup so if for example um a family member has shown some interest obviously they would have to get in contact directly to the living donor team at the at the hospital um, and just say look you know I've come I want to come forward as a living donor they then give them all the paperwork but what they do now and um, we've put together and again seven eight years ago when I came forward there wasn't a lot in fact there wasn't any culturally relevant information so apart from your standard living donation information you get there's this cult there's this sense of cultural identity that within our, within our community that is so important and and it's it's interesting because you could just go on the train and you see somebody is black there's this unconscious knob that you give that yeah hi I, I kind of see you so it was important for us to also make sure that as anybody that's coming forward for the process that they had information and they saw people that looked like them. So we actually put together a booklet of about 18 black living donors. So you've got a photograph, they're all black, so they look like you. And it's about their stories. So you've got mothers, husbands, wives, just ordinary people who've donated to a loved one and you're reading about their story. And it's just so powerful. So the living donor will give you this pack you know, so in that pack, there's how you can contact gold with regards to the peer body scheme. You can read the story of about seven or eight living donors who've been on that journey. And even those that, like myself, that came forward, but weren't successful as well. So I think it's also good to put the good, the bad and the ugly, you know, together. So, yeah. I think it's good to have that balance because as much as we want to be positive and uplifting and talk about the success stories, I think it's also important to show that it doesn't always turn out the way that you hope. But also, as has been said by Jan in another podcast, if you're not in a position to be a living donor, then you can sign up to be a deceased donor or a blood donor, or you can give in different ways. So I'm aware that there's so many different ways that you can give. So in terms of gold, is your focus directed kidney donation yes it is yes and i i find that most um as i said we've got about 504 oh, over 550 donors and majority of them are donated to siblings you know loved ones a few have donated to friends i i know some who have donated to friends and i said earlier on there's one or two that i know who are um, altruistic donors but I think within the black community as we said earlier um, D, we're still it's still a challenge and it's sadly the last financial year we only had 25 black living donors we had over 890 white living donors and even with the aging community we had more we had about 74 um, donors so we've got a lot more work to do within the black community uh, so 25 is not very good so I I'm I'm on a mission you know I'm in, on a mission next year well starting from this year I'm on a mission to challenge each of the London transplant centers and the QE because they have the next highest number of black patients I'm trying to challenge them that can we perform just one, just one, not two, can we perform just one black live donor transplant each month? 
And I say, is that an ambitious task? Yes, but I also feel that we can do it. And I think if we can work in collaboration, if the clinical leads can work in, in collaboration with the community leads, i.e. organizations like ourselves, I think it, it, it's achievable. We, we have to get those numbers up. Um, and I said, if we can just get it up by one, one transplant each month, that's great. So that, that's, that's my challenge um, at the moment. And, and I think we can do it. What is the number one thing that you would like the black community to know about living donation? That you can live normally, you can live a normal life with one kidney. Because the, the, the fear is that if I donate my kidney, can I still do all the things that I wanted to do? Can I still travel? Can I still have a healthy lifestyle? Well, supposing um, something happens to me and I need my kidney. We didn't, we had a, an event last year, D, and we called it the big conversation because we really wanted to find out, just as you've asked me, okay, black people, what is really stopping you from coming forward as a donor? And it wasn't culture, as we thought, it wasn't faith, it was fear. Fear just stopped people dead in their tracks. And it was actually fear from patients. They were fearful of even asking their loved ones. Well, supposing they say no. Supposing they say no, you know, is that gonna cause a rift between the family? So do you know what, I'm, I prefer not to say no, I prefer not to ask, just in case they say no. And then it now causes a rift, you know, within the family, I'll take my chances and wait for a transplant. Or you've got family members who want to, but well, supposing, you know, I can't get pregnant or one of my children needs a kidney, you know? So really it, it was fear and it was interesting. We had that event just talking to other people who had done it and they looked healthy and they were getting on with their lives. Really empowered people to say, well, if they can do it, why can't I? We had somebody called Derica. Derica's 20 and she donated to her dad. And it's like, well, if Derica's 20 and she can donate to her dad, well, what am I doing? And I'm 45, you know? So it, 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 was, that, it was that interesting to see. So I, I, I would think it's that, but I, I also think like anything, as we said, uh, when, I, when I think, when I actually think of Maranja's quote, it's like when we know better, we do better. And it is about raising awareness. It's about raising more awareness. So one of the ways we wanted to raise awareness about living donation within the black community was for the black community to hear stories of people who had actually donated um, a kidney. Um, so two years ago, we put on an event called Because of You, and we invited all the black living donors who had donated in the UK in the last five, 10, how long it was, or we had about 250 uh, living donors that turned up. And it was such an amazing event to see all these living donors and their recipients all in one place. But what wow. was so powerful about it was like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know another like living donor. Oh my gosh, isn't it great to see another living donor? They were exchanging their stories. And for a lot of people, it was, this is actually the first time I'm actually talking about my journey and my experience. But what we also did was we were invited potential donors who were still on the fence. They really weren't too sure, well, do I really want to do that? But they sat at that table and they heard stories. And on that event, there were few people who were so, you know what, I'm doing this. So it really was finding creative ways really to raise awareness of living donation and getting those stories out there. I mean, like I said, we've done a few podcasts on living donation. We've done um, videos, uh, this is my story. We've done one where you can write from the beginning of I want to be a living donor right up to the whole process. So I think it's just getting that information out there and just let people hear those the stories and just see how healthy they are with the one kidney. So events like this, uh, 
very powerful and I really do believe that sharing stories, which is why I do the Kidney Warrior Story interviews, I really believe that when people hear of people's lived experiences, this is easier for them to relate to in terms of their own lives and is so powerful. I think it's absolutely amazing and life-changing and the fact that it has encouraged people to say, I'm going to go for this now, is That is awesome. So I know that you've got an event coming up, um, a coffee morning. So tell me about what's happening. I one thing about me, dear, I've kind of noticed I'm and I I don't I have to say, I I think no, it is. It's my Christian faith. One of my favorite scriptures is I can do all things through Jesus Christ. And I literally, I literally just take that word and I just run with it. And I like to think out of the box and I like to kind of almost be the first bringing all the black living donors in the UK that was a first the big conversation we did in collaboration with um, London South Bank University that was a first so we're having our first virtual coffee morning and again it's going to be something whereby we're talking about kidney disease and the kidney disease obviously is, is connected to living donation. But we need to tackle that first. You know, why are people in the black community? Why are we developing more likely to develop kidney failure five times more? What is it that we are doing? Is it our diet? Is it the food that we're eating? Do we need to do more? Does the renal association need to do more to really raise awareness of kidney disease you know and its relationship to our diet I mean for example we know that when you smoke you know it it causes lung cancer you know so they've done so much don't smoke well I think personally for me needs to be a little bit more in terms of the links between high blood pressure diabetes and kidney failure Uh, and, and I think that a lot of that needs to be done. And I think if we could do that, if we, as you rightly said, get people to do their blood test, if we can just do more as a community to look at our diet, I think that that figure of five, we can slowly bring it, bring it down. So that really for me is the aim of our coffee morning. Well, what is kidney disease? What are the functions? What causes it? What are the symptoms? And what can we as a community really do? And when is this coffee morning and how can people access it? The coffee morning is on the 30th of March, at the end of March, and it's all part of um, the National Kidney Month, which is the month of, of, of May, of not May, sorry, of March. Um, it's from 10.30 to 12, so only one and a half hours. Um, you can register on Eventbrite. We can give you the, the, the details. Um, and it's a Zoom. It's, it's virtual. You can dip in. You can dip out. Um, it's going to be music. It's going to be very, very light. It's going to be very, very relaxed. And we're going to hear stories from, from patients. We're going to have a bit of information from healthcare professionals. And we're also going to hear from stakeholders. Um, okay, what can they do? How can they support the Black community in trying to reduce some of the figures that are currently out there music quiz so it's going to be a morning of fun but also a morning of trying to empower people and get that information out there and do you have a final word for the listeners yes i mean black lives matter and that that's very important and our lives do matter and our health matters as well we need to make sure that we eat healthily we take care of ourselves, we have regular checkups. So anything like high blood pressure, diabetes, they can be early detected. And also when we say Black Lives Matter, we need more black people to sign up to the organ donor register, be a stem cell donor, be a blood donor. If we say Black Lives Matter, then as a community, we really have to put words and deeds into our actions absolutely I totally agree and for my final questions um, how can the listeners 
get in contact with you online and what is the information if they want to be a living donor? Well, they can go to our website, um, www.giftoflivingdonation.co.uk and all the information there, if, if, it's, if you want to know more about living donation, the living donation process, it's there. If you want to be um, join the buddy scheme, that information is there. And if you just want to listen to some of the videos that we've got there, it's really, really detailed. So I will say, go to the site, dip into it, and you'll get as much information about living donation um, from, from, this, well, from the website. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for the information that you share today. I know it will make a massive difference for so many people. As we've said, knowledge is power. And by sharing this today, I hope that if there's someone out there who's on the fence and is considering being a living donor, I hope this empowers them to take that step and make that decision. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, dear. And, you know, ultimately, one of the reasons why we are both doing this is it's to change lives, it's to transform lives. And I think if it's just one person who's heard this podcast and said, you know what, I never actually thought about being a living donor. I'm, I'm just going to even check it out. I'm just going to kind of get some more information. I'm just going to empower myself with, with that knowledge then our work has, you know, we've, we've, we've succeeded. So it really is about how can we change lives and how can we transform lives? So it's been such a pleasure being able to be on the show and just share my experience and, and my journey um, with your listeners. Thank you for listening to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. And don't forget that you can contact me on social media using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. Please do subscribe to the podcast and please do tell a friend. New episodes of this podcast are released every Monday. Until next time, take care and choose to live. Diary of a Kitty Warrior. Sharing faith, knowledge, hope and love.